Roby Helm back with you from Bloomington Speedway in Bloomington, New Jersey. 100 lap Hooters Cup late model event. Now under caution, working lap number 48 of a scheduled 100 lapper. And we have another angle of the incident involving Mike Harvey. So let's take a look at that on slow motion replay. Dick Anderson was the race leader when Kenny Imler in the 87 car spun in front of the leaders. Anderson just got to the outside, and Garvey just had no place to go, hitting that 87 car head on, taking out the radiator of the Maccabee contractor Chevrolet Monte Carlo. And there you see the hood going up on the 87 car. And Mario Gosselin, he had a close call there too with the 10 car as he just got by on the outside. Another car coming into view, spinning up on the outside of the racetrack. So just to have two cars involved in that, Mark Bouchardi, as they say, that is pretty unbelievable. Uh, that, was, that was incredible here because they say when you have a wreck here, like we saw earlier, it takes out four, five, six cars. And to have it happen in front of the leaders, you've got a lot of fast cars coming at you and you're sitting backwards in front of the racetrack. And we are under caution as the track cleanup continues. They've put an awful lot of speedy dry all the way around this 5 8 mile square oval here at Flemington, New Jersey, a historic facility that has been racing cars since 1915. And, Mark, we were down in the museum looking at some of the uh, cars and stars that have raced here in the past. Uh, people like uh, Ira Vale, Ralph De Palma, Peter De Palo have raced here. Uh, Ted Horn raced here. All kinds of different Drivers and a young Italian kid in the early 60s race here and won some of his first national events, and that was a young kid by the name of Mario Andretti. Mario Andretti, Troy Rutman. you got a lot of your IndyCar drivers that did come out of this, this area, this racetrack, back when they ran those type of race cars. If you're ever in this area and you want to see a great racetrack with a lot of history, it's worth it just to come to the racetrack to go through the museum. And one thing about this speedway, as we say, it's been here for a long time. It's part of the uh, Flemington Fairgrounds that's been in operation since 1856. They raced horses here until 1915 when they started racing cars. And the current promoter here, Paul Cool, is in a fight right now to save this facility as the uh, fair board has been entertaining an opportunity to sell this property to a shopping center developer. And I know that Paul Cool is battling hard trying to buy this facility, and we want to wish him all the luck in the world because there is a lot of tradition and a lot of history at this facility, and I sure would hate to see this beautiful racetrack become uh, a department store or shopping mall. Oh, it'd be sad to see something with so much history going down the drain. And it's almost like it needs to be taken over by the historic society just to be preserved as some place that's a classic. And this race track is definitely a classic. It kind of looks like uh, the Indianapolis Motor Speedway cut in two and kind of squeezed together. It is a square race track. It has four turns and four straightaways. They have a front straightaway and then a straightaway between turns one and two. You have your back straightaway between turns three and four. And then you have another short straightaway between turns three and four. So, I mean, it's a unique layout, and they almost drive the racetrack. The racing groove here, Mark, is like a diamond. Right, they, they drive a diamond here. They drive it hard and let it float up to the, to the outside retaining walls in all four straightaways. A lot of the drivers when they got here, they did not like this racetrack. There's still a few that don't like this racetrack. But Jody Ridley made the statement early that once you get a little bit of seat time here, a lot of them are going to like it. And as they got more practice, a lot of them do like this racetrack. One thing about it, the cars do run some fast speeds here as they've been clocked at well over 100 miles an hour on each of these four short straightaways. But as fast as they're going, it's not necessarily a horsepower racetrack because in talking to the drivers yesterday, not too many of them said that they really were getting in the throttle hard. Right, coming off the corners, they say they skate, which means the track's not abrasive. They're spinning the tires coming off the turns, so horsepower is useless when the tires spin. So you have to be able to handle through the turns. 
And this is definitely not only a driver's race track, but the crew chiefs as well, working with the drivers to set these cars up, have to come up with the right combination. And the driver has to be able to drive the car around the speedway. So you can't really rely on out horsepowering another driver. You have to rely on out handling them and out driving them. And we've got a couple of drivers uh, contrasting in experience up in front. The veteran Dick Anderson in the Mopar Performance Dodge Adventure car number 92 up front. Mario Goslin looking for major sponsorship in car number 10. His Chevrolet Monte Carlo running in the second spot. His first full year of national competition as we get set to go back to green flag action. Dick Anderson will bring him off the fourth turn. And he got a good restart over Mario Goslin. And Goslin he got even a better start on the third place driver Todd Pro in car number 38. Dicky Anderson is great to watch on restarts. He will not restart the same place in a hundred restarts. He just knows how to uh, catch somebody sleeping. And in the Formula Cup race we had a situation where it looked like it was snowing on the front straightaway with the styrofoam from the styrofoam block blowing down the front straightaway. Now we have speedy drive blowing everywhere as it blows up the racetrack and we've got a problem down the front straightaway. Two cars getting together, the 14 car and the 20 car. We still remain under green though. Right, they did a great job of keeping to put somebody at the wall and taking this thing back to caution again. But maybe we can run green for a while and let these guys race and see what happens. We had Joe Strangle Sr. in the 14 car and Joe Nagel in the 20 car getting together and it looked like the 14 car, he may have a flat right rear tire on that car, but it looks like he's moving along pretty good. Right now we're fixing to have a lot of lap traffic come into play. Dicky Anderson knows how to get around the lap traffic. They don't seem to be getting out of his way, which makes it tough. Mario Goslin used it to his advantage to get back up onto the back bumper of Dickie Anderson. One thing about Dick Anderson, you can bet if those lap cars won't get out of his way, he'll let them hear that chrome horn. Right, Dickie's a master at making, kind of like the Earnhardt intimidation. He can use the, use his bumper to let you know he's there. Kind of intimidation. And we got a car backwards on the front straightaway. We've got trouble right here on the front straightaway. Car number nine involved in his second tangle of the evening. And that is one of the local automobiles. That's Charlie Fawn Jr. out of Layton, Pennsylvania. In the Layton Lincoln Mercury Ford Thunderbird spinning down the front straightaway. And we have got a replay. Let's see what happened with the nine car. Unbelievable. Coming off of turn number four, Layton gets loose up on the high side. Just misses the styrofoam barriers coming off the fourth turn. Spins the car around and it looks like he'll slap the guardrail in the left front corner of the automobile. Locks the brakes down to keep the car up on the high side of the racetrack as the rest of the cars move on the inside. Well, this was a car that was involved in a wreck earlier, so you don't know how that car was handling. It just looked like it broke loose on him. Something may have broke, or else maybe he just cannot drive the car like he wanted to. Charlie Fawn Jr. in the nine car, bringing out the caution flag. There you can see him moving on the speedway with damage to the front end of the automobile. And he's got damage on the back end from the earlier incident, too. So it looks like he's still got maybe uh, one corner left on that car. And the roof and the roof so he's got plenty of sheet metal left he, the left front fender is gone I think he lost that on the earlier incident as we did not see that lane down there on the racetrack on the front straightaway but we have 53 laps in the books now completing lap 54 as they cross the stripe the caution laps do count until we reach lap number 90 and then the remaining 10 laps will be run under green Dick Anderson is out in front as they get the one to go signal Mario Gosselin in second that's how they finished at Anderson, South Carolina, Mark Bichardi. Are we going to see an instant replay of two weeks ago? If Dickie Anderson hopes so, Mary Go Mario Goslin hopes not. We're getting a chance to watch Dickey on the restart again. Let's see where he restarts this time. Got a tremendous restart last time over Mario Gosselin in the 10 car, and they caught the third place car, John Crow. He was flat sleeping on that restart, but he's right up there with him this time. There's Anderson back on the th